Okay, so we're back on uh, chapter chapter four, and uh, this uh, chapter looks at uh, the main thing I want to spend uh, spend a little bit of time with you on on today is uh, social status, social roles, social structure, which I think students. Uh, uh, find to be, I'm sorry, we're on chapter five, chapter five today, uh, on social interaction, and uh, I want to spend some time on the concept of social structure, social status, social roles, and then I'm going to relate that to, uh, in the late, a little bit later in the chapter with uh, Goffman's uh, dramaturgical model, which is, which is related, and uh, he just puts it in a different uh, a different theoretical uh, framework, if you will, a symbolic interactionist framework. Uh, but uh, this chapter starts out by looking at uh, two historical macro uh, social forms in which uh, we can uh, discern two different types of uh, social interaction patterns. And so it starts out by talking about uh, traditional societies, or pre-industrial society, and uh, taking uh, Durkheim's notion of solidarity. And uh, Durkheim said that in pre-industrial societies, the solidarity is based on a sense of sameness. Uh, he didn't mean that in a flippant sense or superficial sense. The, the sameness is uh, built into the, uh, basically into the economic activities of the society itself and such that uh, uh, the statuses in the earlier traditional forms of society, here we're talking about uh, agricultural communities, yeah, you know, we could even go back and talk about uh, uh, tribal societies. Uh, they tended to be smaller scale. The, uh, Fewer, fewer people in numbers, uh, people knew each other, uh, the uh, relationships were tended to be emotional, emotionally uh, bonding uh, along kinship lines. And uh, importantly, the, uh, the statuses in that type of community were more uniform than you will find in industrial or post-industrial society. So that, for example, uh, the women, it may be mostly along gender lines, so that women will be taking care of the home in uh, various tasks, you know, taking care of the home, uh, gardening, taking care of the children, making clothes, uh, just various tasks uh, around the home, home and hearth. And uh, while the men may be, for example, all farmers. So in that type of society then, the uh, the statuses are quite uniform. They're not complex. And a simple division of labor, uh, you know, generally uh, uh, divided along gender lines, it's going to be a, a, a uniform society in terms of uh, the statuses played out. You don't have a variety or a diverse field of statuses and hierarchy of statuses such as, you know, our job scale today. Uh, so in that society, Durkheim said that. Uh, that the information in that society, this solidarity is based on uniformity of thinking and feeling, uh, such that people are more like each other. So they base this social interaction on terms of sameness. Uh, if you grew up in a small community, you would be able to uh, see this uh, same, some, somewhat same pattern. Everybody knows everybody else, and, and uh, you know, in a farming community, uh, Everybody's uh, pretty much doing the same kinds of uh, daily activities. Everybody knows each other. Everybody shares the, tends to share the same beliefs, same values. So really what's striking in that situation uh, would be difference. Uh, when somebody acts differently or, or does not take on the, uh, conform to the social patterns of a smaller community, uh, they may be seen as, as uh, outcast or, or deviant from, from the rest do not want to be like the rest of the folks in the community. So difference tends to be shunned in that, in that kind of society. Uh, so again, the, the uh, status is a uniform, and it's based on the social interactions based on who you know, the sameness uh, across the board. 
of norms and values and beliefs and activities. Uh, and uh, on page 121, he talks about two different types of solidarity. It's easy to get these confused, so you want to take note and uh, make sure you get these right with the right type of uh, the definition with the right type of society. So, in uh, in the society we were just describing, we we, we Durkheim called that. Uh, I'm sorry, not Durkheim, but Turnings, sociologist by the name of Turnings, uh, called this mechanical solidarity. Uh, it's, and it's solidarity is based again on sameness. And the other type of society which we're going to be spending some time on is the uh, organic solidarity. And organic solidarity is a social order based on interdependence and also uh, cooperation among people performing a variety of tasks. So in, in this type of society now the division of labor has come, become much more complex in an industrialized post-industrial society. And the attorneys call this organic solidarity. Uh, and the people in, in, in terms of their social interaction in this type of society is based on interdependence and as well as difference from each other. Uh, but Durkheim uh, theorized that uh, uh, even though the society is much more complex and people do not know each other, it's less emotionally uh, bonding, uh, that people still have a need for interdependence on each other because in a simple way, uh, people are no longer uh, jacks of all trades, right? So while you're a college student, uh, maybe working it as well, you don't have time to, to grow your own food and make your own clothing, and, uh, you know, take care of the garbage in the community, uh, you know, doctor everyone in the community or in your home. So we rely on others, specialization, people that have specializations in other areas. So while you're specializing to be an uh, uh, elementary uh, teacher, others are specializing in, in other areas. So, that are needed in social life, such as a you know surgeon, a person that's uh, working uh, taking out the garbage, the garbage collectors, uh, the farmers growing your food, the dentist taking care of your teeth. So I, th I think you see where we're going here. That uh, uh, in this type of society, everybody's interdependent because we depend on each other for our very survival. Everybody's specializing in their own area and uh, playing out their their statuses and roles. And in so doing, it helps to bring about, for Durkheim, a sense of order in society and st stability. So uh, that's, a, that's a sort of a start to, towards getting at uh, this area I wanted to talk about, which was uh, social status, social roles, and uh, uh, also uh, social structure. Uh, and this begins about... Let's see, this starts around page one, 125, and it goes on for several pages. Um, I'd like to say that, um, you know, if, if you look up from the, the chapters we've covered up to this point, most of them have been concerned with uh, how individuals are uh, socialized into society, how we become members in, of, of society through our culture through socialization and uh, so uh, at, up to this point it's been about uh, social integration if you will uh, some later chapters uh, specifically the next chapter deals with deviance how we deviate from the norm but up to this point we've been talking about uh, how individuals are integrated into society through the uh, culture and socialization normative order uh, if you will this chapter uh, is very sociological in its, uh, in its uh, underpinnings, and uh, these concepts are really central to thinking about how we, as individuals, are, how we become inscribed into society, how we become members of society so that we can communicate with each other and do the business of uh, society. So when we talk about social structure, statuses, and roles. And then with roles, when we talk about the norms of the uh, attached or ex expectations attached to uh, the statuses in which we play out, uh, it's important to 
uh, be able to uh, make a summation of these. And I think uh, we can do that without having to. Uh, sometimes you're studying along, you you think that these uh, that these statuses are in some way separate from each other, and they're not. They're very integrated with each other. So one way to uh, sort of give yourself a, a sentence to think about here would be that social structure, I'm sorry, a social status is a position in a social structure in which we enact roles. So, so a social position is a, is a position that we take up in a social structure in which we enact roles. So a social status is a any pos is a position in society. Uh, they're not uh, they tend not to be static. And uh, for example, we move in and out of statuses over our lifetime. Uh, you know, for example, if you you go to college, you, you become you take up the status of student, and then uh, after you graduate, you take up a, maybe a new status as an employer, or maybe even get married. That's another status. And uh, so some statuses tend to stay with us, uh, ascribed statuses, those things that we can, can't very easily change, such as uh, one's ethnicity, one's gender, uh, one's age, right? Uh, those, those are called ascribed statuses. And then the other type of status would be achievement status. Those are statuses that uh, we achieve on through our own efforts. Uh, those uh, statuses, those achievement statuses can be positive uh, or they could be negative, right? If you get in trouble for whatever reason, you break the law and you get in trouble, you may uh, end up in prison, right? That's, that's an achievement status. It's a negative one. Uh, or if you, you know, you don't do what's expected of you on your job, you lose your job, you lose your 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 family. Let's say you become homeless, and that sense that would be, on an individual basis, that would be a, a negative uh, achievement status. But then we've got a host of positive statuses, social statuses as well, uh, ascribed statuses, uh, such as you're achieving your college degree is certainly a, a positive uh, uh, achievement status. So anyway, so that so. Uh, uh, social status is a position that we take up. That social status does not belong to us individually. This is very sociological. It's not a psychological uh, phenomenon. Social status is it's, uh, is made available through our culture. And let's, let's, for example, in education, the student status is a status social status that belongs to the institution itself. Uh, and we know this because uh, before you came came to, to university, the social status was of a student was already here, maybe and occupied by somebody else, right? And then after you leave or you graduate, we leave that social status and it's still here. Somebody else takes it up, right? The next student, and they have to play out the same uh, role expectations that you had to play out while you were a student. So in that sense, then, uh, a social status belongs to the, the institution in which it is uh, situated, uh, and then that can vary uh, from family membership, uh, you know, occupational, you, just many, many different, just whatever groups uh, you're in that you're a member of, you'll have a social status uh, in, that, in that group, whatever its nature. Um, so... Uh, when we talk about social status in a social structure, a social structure is uh, social structure is not something we can see or put our hands on. It's intangible, but it exists as a as Durkheim uh, stated earlier. It's, it's it's a social fact that's that exists in society. It's simply two or more people occupying social statuses and interacting in expected ways. A couple of important aspects of the, of the concept here in terms of its definition. Two or more people occupying, right, taking up a position, 
right? That's social statuses and interacting in expected ways. And we, the author does not uh, extend the definition just a little. Some some textbooks do, and I, I wish uh, that we had it here, but I'll go ahead and give it to you. Uh, two or more people occupying social statuses and inter interacting in expected ways regardless of the personalities involved. I think that's important to stress. It's uh, that, that way it removes it in ter terms of talking about it. It's not a psychological phenomenon. It's not determined. The personality can play a part. It's, it's not determined by you and I taking up the status that uh, creates that status. It's there before we enter. It's there after, after we leave. So the social structure is there to structure how two or more, I want to say statuses, how they are, how they interact with each other in terms of the uh, roles that are attached to those statuses. Now roles mean basically the norms that are, any, any status that we, we have, there are certain norms attached to it, that is expectations of how we behave in that uh, social status. So we have uh, um, in terms of uh, expectations, for example, of being a student, uh, you have expectations in terms of your obligations in the social structure between the instructor, which is one social status, and then the student status in interaction. You, you taking up the uh, student status and you have to learn the rights and obligations expectations of your status so you know a student has the obligations to come to class on time uh, to read their materials to study hard uh, you know to write their papers not to plagiarize the work uh, do your best on on your exams be here for your exams so these are expectations attached to your uh, student status and then you can think of uh, other statuses that you have and think about the uh, expectations that are attached to each of those. Now the chapter does, well it does, it does kind of mention, uh, uh, when we talk about your, your status set, these are all the statuses that you have at this particular time in your life. So one way you can do this is to draw a little chart, a circle, take a piece of paper, draw a small circle in the middle and put self in the, in the small circle in the middle. And then you can draw all these little spokes out from like a wagon wheel. And in those uh, top of those spokes, you can put in that particular status that you belong to and go all the way around and just think of all the, the various groups that you belong to and uh, just fill in those, those uh, statuses, those, those groups you belong to, what your position is, uh, student, worker, uh, you know, husband, wife, uh, team leader at, at uh, you know, some university, uh, uh, athletic team, uh, mother, father, just retired person, unemployed person, that's the status. And just go around the circle and, and put in all your, and that's called your status set. And some statuses, especially a, uh, 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 a scribe status is doesn't stay with you some for a lifetime, but many other statuses, especially achievement statuses, uh, will uh, you know you'll come they'll come and go. So you you can always update your uh, your status set. You can always uh, check in on it to see uh, what statuses you have at some particular time in your life. And uh, so again it's not very it's, it's somewhat a abstract but I think that if you'll just think through your all the groups you belong to and then think about the statuses you have in those groups each one of those uh, each one of those has a social structure built in uh, as you interact with others within that group so for example let's uh, just finish up with uh, looking at uh, the teacher student social status again so in terms of, of my position, I'm in the status of, of instructor. So I, I have certain role requirements, expectations that I have to uh, conform to. So 
and you uh, as well in your status as student you have a, a set of expectations right rights and obligations so when we look at the the uh, how this is structured socially structured those role expectations between two uh, statuses instructor and student or students uh, my rights and obligations are related to your rights and obligations and so it's sort of a two-way street so your obligations become my rights and my obligations to you become your your rights and uh, so that's structured beforehand so uh, when we play this out when we conform and play out uh, our role expectations within this uh, social structure in terms of our statuses then the work of the class can get done without much problem uh, I mean theoretically we could actually uh, have a class and not know each other at all really personally if we just played out our statuses it can be maybe kind of a impersonal kind of course <laughs> but uh, if we play these out we would still be able to, to reach the goal of the class and, and do the class and, uh, and you could get your grade at the end and, and we could move on from there to your next class uh, without really even having a lot of uh, personal but of course we like we personalize it and we do bring our uh, personalities and in, are involved in our, our idiosyncratic uh, uh, ways are uh, certainly expressed in these statuses that we play out uh, there's a concept that's not in the text but uh, we call it uh, uh, we can in a status we can actually either conform very rigidly to the role expectations or we can back away from the status expectations to some extent and allows for some flexibility and in that sense then you can talk more about uh, you know personality types for example you have different uh, teaching styles and interactive styles between instructors and uh, all this can allows for some room for flexibility but nonetheless the social structure in terms of its expectations uh, have to be adhered to in order for the work to get done and uh, this is very important for us in the uh, in the uh, uh, industrialized post-industrialized uh, society complex division of labor we don't know everybody so how do we think about it how do we maintain order how do we uh, interact in the society w among strangers if you will and for for the functionalists one of the most important ways would be uh, through uh, these summations of social statuses so that we, uh, we don't really have to know the person as much as we have to be socialized to know about the role expectations attached to uh, that person's status so for example if you're if you're in your vehicle leaving school and you're caught speeding and you get pulled over by the highway uh, highway patrol uh, you don't you know, nine times out of ten, you're not going to know who that officer is. But uh, what do you bank your? First of all, why did you pull over in the first place, right? So you recognize the expectation that you're in a social structure between this uh, highway patrol person and uh, yourself as a citizen. So you know you do the right thing. Your expectation is to pull over when they turn their light on, and. Uh, and then uh, waiting for the, the officer to come up to your car you have certain expectations about you you, you know you've been socialized to know uh, basically how this should go and uh, how you should interact with that status not so much that person because you don't know that person uh, so you bank your uh, your predictability that that uh, highway patrol person is going to play out their status uh, they're, they're going to conform to their role expectations and in doing so then you, you you have some sense of predictability of how they should behave towards you if they don't behave towards you in, the, in terms of the expectations for their status then you know they're deviating from and that's for that's next chapter we'll be talking about deviance uh, <clears throat> so you can see that uh, 
by simply uh, knowing the role uh, requirements for, say, uh, your professors. You, you know what that status is. You kind of know what the uh, role requirements are, the role expectations of being a uh, an instructor, so that uh, you know you should be able to, to function pretty well at uh, in going from class to class, interacting with uh, professors because you kind of know what what to expect from them, right? And the same goes for for your your statuses. So in being in, in being able to know uh, uh, the various statuses in society and how to can you know the the role expectations, it makes uh, social interaction much much more uh, easier than if you had to know that person personally, which is impossible. And this makes it possible then for uh, for complex societies to get the work done uh, without there being uh, you know. We talk about a lot of times about disorganization and, and crime and, and other issues, but uh, it's still a rather um, uh, fascinating uh, phenomenon to see with uh, millions of people living together that uh, we have as much social order that we do. And a lot of this has to do with the uh, conformity to uh, the role expectations of uh, the statuses that people are on an everyday basis are playing out. So this is a very... Uh, uh, I think very insightful uh, set of concepts for you and uh, really an important, really a, a very central set of concepts in, in understanding uh, uh, how individuals uh, align themselves and interact in society and conform to what's expect ex ex expected of them. And I think these concepts are just very, very much uh, sociological. And uh, so, uh, and also, students sometimes think they are somewhat uh, very abstract, and it's true. I mean, they are very abstract because they're trying to get at some very, uh, uh, you know, large amount, large amount of, uh, of social phenomena. Uh, but there's another theory near the back that that really is relating to this whole thing about social statuses, and that's the. Uh, the dramaturgical model of social interaction, and um, this was uh, developed by a sociologist by the name of Irving Goffman, and uh, he uh, developed the dramaturgical model of social interaction. And to some extent, it's uh, it it, uh, it kind of offers a more of an uh, a, a, a vision of how social structures, social statuses, and roles are, are actually uh, realized at the everyday level. Uh, for example, you don't you don't come to your classes uh, thinking, "Oh, I got to get into my student role now here, and I've got to," you know, you're not you're not conscious of that. There's, you know, you're not even aware of, and this is how social facts work: is we we tend not to be conscious of them. We Think of our behaviors simply the way it is, as it's as if it's natural to us. Uh, the dramaturgical model tries to get at that and show that what is really going on at the uh, ground level of everyday life. And so he developed this notion of a dramaturgical model. And drama dramaturgy is based on yes, the no, the theatrical notion of drama. And uh, Goffman took serious the uh, that old saying that uh, society is uh, the world is a stage and we're all just actors on playing our part, and uh, he takes that quite seriously, and uh, he took that quite seriously, and he developed this theory, and uh, I think this will give you even some some better understanding of social status and social roles by looking how it gets played out uh, among everyday uh, actors. Uh, so he has this. Uh, there's really three theories, I'm sorry, three concepts that uh, that uh, we want to know in terms of getting to a you know, basic understanding of the dramaturgical model. Um, and one of the uh, central concepts is um, impression management. And so it, you, you can relate to impression management to, you know, social status and, and especially uh, social roles, role playing if you will, and um, Goffman says that uh, whatever situation we're in, we will 
uh, we will uh, attempt to manage how we give off impressions to others in our audience. Uh, and he uses quite a few examples. Uh, one could be the uh, very uh, uh, one that's uh, used a lot is an employment uh, interview. You know, like when you go to an interview, you don't sit there and tell them everything about yourself, especially the, the negative aspects of your life. You, you try your best to put your, as Goffman would say, you put your best foot forward in that situation because after all, you're trying to uh, obtain a, a, a job at that, uh, whatever job that is, right, company or school or so, uh, you know, your resume acts as, your resume can act as a sort of prop, you know, a theatrical prop, you know, and uh, have it well organized and show your experiences, your education, also how you dress, what is the appropriate uh, expected dress for that interview. You know, you try to look your best, uh, remain, uh, can, I'm sorry, uh, keep your eye contact during the interview, uh, and how your other nonverbal uh, behaviors, try to be conscious of them so that uh, you give a favorable impression. You know, in job uh, interviews, uh, it's stated that, uh, that uh, they know they're going to, whether they're going to hire you within the first uh, 30, 30 seconds of the interview whether they, they have a favorable impression of you or not. So you don't have a lot of time. So uh, Goffman says that we'll do our best to manage our impressions in that situation to obtain that favorable feedback from our environment. And uh, that, that, one's a, that example is quite, uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a, a very convenient one, but uh, you, you need to take that uh, and think of all your other statuses, such as, uh, uh, let's say, being a father or being a mother uh, in the family. That's also uh, a, uh, for Goffin, that's, a, that's also another dramaturgical setting. And uh, when we're in, we're in the public eye, and the public eye would be your other family members, we will uh, use impression management. That is, and again, think about the uh, role requirements for statuses, uh, playing out uh, to our best of our ability and put our best foot forward and plan out what's expected of being, uh, our culture expects of a mother or father and how to interact with uh, each other and with, uh, with their children. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, we don't, uh, uh, we don't uh, say it, we don't act just any old way. We, tailor our behavior in that situation in terms of uh, you want to be thought of by your kids as a good mother, good father. So we try to manage our impressions to our children. Most of us do. I mean, we don't, we're not perfect, perfect at it, but uh, certainly we try to uh, conform so that our children can grow up to be healthy and uh, productive. Um, and we can think of just many other other examples, but to, to think further, I think we have to introduce the other two concepts: of front stage, backstage. So impression management is based, uh, McGoffin says, based on these two two areas, uh, and uh, again, it has, it has that metaphor of the theater uh, metaphors from the theater. The front stage is when we're on stage in terms of our um, being in the public. Or maybe uh, being in the family, you're with other family members in the classroom, you're on stage, you're in the class with other students and the professor. When you're at work, right, you're, you're there with, around your bosses and your coworkers, even, even on the street, right, uh, or in a restaurant. That's the front stage. You're on cue, and this is where impression management takes place. Uh, it's the area of everyday of life visible to an audience. Uh, and so people take care to create their and maintain their images and behavior in front of the whatever audience uh, at that time. Uh, the backstage area is an area where it's an area of everyday life uh, where the audience is out of sight. And this is where an individual can uh, do things that would not be appropriate on the front stage. And also, it's a, a place where a person can go and uh, let their hair down and maybe get prepared for the next uh, stage entrance. 
Uh, so I think at the backstage is sort of a private area where we uh, can, you know, where we can do things that we wouldn't do in the public arena. Uh, give you a good example of uh, front stage, backstage would be uh, uh, myself and probably some of you in class uh, have been waiters or are waiters or waitresses at this time. So the uh, the restaurant's a good example to use uh, in terms of front stage, backstage. Uh, the front stage in the restaurant would be, of course, where the clients are sitting, uh, coming in and sitting and uh, having dinner or whatever. And that's the front stage. That's where the waiters and come out and the managers perhaps, maitre d, and uh, interact with uh, the clientele. The backstage would be, as you might guess, would be the kitchen area. Kitchen area, things will go on. So in this, in this uh, scenario, uh, you may have things that will go on in the backstage in the restaurant, such as the kitchen, that would never go, never happen on the front stage where you're trying, the restaurant especially is trying to keep up its impression management it's just, say trying to be a, a, a five-star restaurant, for example. Maybe a five-star restaurant on the front stage where people are being served, but it may not be in the kitchen area where, where things are going on that may, would certainly not be appropriate for the front stage. So um, uh, in, my, in my own experience, I know working in, in when I uh, lived in Nashville for a number of years, uh, working as a waiter, uh, we would have, and this, this was a five-star restaurant, and uh, we had a lot of uh, well-known people from the music, in, music industry in Nashville that would come in, uh, and uh, it was a very formal kind of, uh, especially at dinner time, and uh, we, had to, we had to wear, as waiters, we had to wear our tuxedos, and uh, it was just very formal dining, five-star restaurant. A lot of a lot of famous people come in and out of there, uh, and so you know we had to really uh, work on our impression management in uh, terms of seating seating people and making sure that the table was set correctly and our demeanor. You know, if you've been a waiter waitress, you know the old thing about smiling to the customers and trying. You know, you get better tips if you really treat them courteously and take care of their needs at the table and. Um, but the backstage sometimes was a frightening uh, place to be. Uh, the uh, one of our chefs there was uh, uh, quite. He hit the bottle quite quite a bit during the evening during his cook. He was a, he was certainly an expert in the, in his ability as a chef. Uh, but he would always, uh, as he would pour the wines into his uh, frying pans, he would also take a little drink each time. And before the evening was over, he was feeling pretty good. And uh, he had third-degree burns on his arms. He had bandages on his arms. He would uh, get mad at the waiters and curse and, uh, you know, drop food on the floor and clean it off, put it back in the frying pan, keep it in frying and put it in the plate and this kind of thing. Things that would happen back there that would never go on. Just his behavior and his demeanor would not be allowed on the front stage of the uh, restaurant. Uh, so uh, uh, I can remember times when uh, he would be uh, called to a table to, to, to be congratulated for the great uh, meal he had prepared. And uh, he would simply, uh, in terms of front stage behavior, in terms of impression management, uh, usually work with a, with a sleeveless uh, a t-shirt on sweating he'd go into the bathroom clean himself up he'd put on a very nice white gown jacket and then down to the floor had a really nice uh, chef's hat all crisp and clean he'd put that on and walk out there as mannerly as he you could be and he would walk to the table acknowledge the, the folks may maybe a, a record executive and their family yeah. And he would acknowledge them and spend time smiling and, and end up coming back with a hundred dollar tip with the, uh, making the rest of us waiters envious throw his uh, clothes back off and get back to cooking and cussing the, cussing the waiters out and carrying on like a crazy guy you know uh, but a very uh, well paid very uh, 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 
a chef in, in demand in that city because of his skills and uh, he certainly had the impression management uh, to where he could, he could deal efficiently and, and, and confidently with uh, these very wealthy some of the same for some famous uh, clientele that would come there so that's just one example or two and there's just many you may want to think of some of these examples and all what we'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll put on the discussion board uh, we'll, we'll have a, a discussion on uh, impression management, front stage, backstage, and I'll ask you to think about uh, some of the uh, statuses that you, you're involved in or have been involved in and, and, and have you to analyze that uh, those experiences by using impression management, front stage, and backstage to uh, do an analysis of your own uh, experiences. I think that that would be very interesting to do. Okay, so I've gone on long enough today. Uh, almost a full class of uh, lecture on this topic. Very interesting topic, though. Uh, and this is really one of the uh, last chapters uh, in terms of looking at social integration. Uh, next chapter is on deviance, and then after that we'll be looking at uh, issues of social inequality in society. So for now, uh, I'll see you on the discussion board. We'll see you next time.